Welcome to the STEAM Discovery Project. I just want to briefly introduce myself and welcome you all in. My name is Adrian Pruszynski. I am the founder and program director for StarTech Global Academy, which is a nonprofit dedicated to STEM diversity. We're the ones bringing you the STEAM Discovery Project today. I'm from Seattle, born and raised. I graduated from Garfield and then joined the Air Force ROTC and studied mathematics at the University of Washington which was actually not a good match for me. I didn't like the program, so I transferred out and discovered my real passion. I became an entrepreneur, and here we are with our latest project. The STEAM Discovery Project is a series of free workshops for teens to discover STEAM education and career pathways, plus the resources to get you there, including careers, scholarships, tutoring, mentors, and more. You may be wondering what exactly is STEAM? Well, STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. You may have heard of STEM. It's STEAM without the arts. Well, when we say arts here, we mean the ways in which technology and STEM are used in the arts. For example, this presentation was made on a digital design app. Part of what we hope you'll find interesting today is all the unique ways that STEAM is used in different types of careers. Before we dive in, I'll go over some quick Zoom etiquette for those of you who are not familiar. In the bottom left corner of your Zoom window, you'll see a microphone with a line through it. This just means you're muted. We'd like everybody to go ahead and stay on mute until the question and answer part, but you're welcome to use the chat feature. This icon is also at the bottom of your window. If you click on the chat icon, it will open up a chat box and you can go ahead and say hi and let us know the chat is working. That's great. And now for your view in Zoom, at the top right of your window is the view icon. There's a side-by-side -side speaker view, which will help you best see who's speaking. I have that circled here. There's also the standard view, which shows the presentation with cameras on top and the side-by-side -side gallery view, which shows the cameras on the side. Last but not least, just a friendly reminder that we are recording the session and translating them into other languages. So community members who are not here can still get all this awesome information. And so if you know someone who might be interested but can't attend the workshop, you can always share the recording with them once we post it. So for those of you at the location at Meadowbrook, hopefully you got some free pizza and enjoyed that. You may also know that the first 10 participants to sign up and complete the workshop exit survey win a $25 Amazon gift card. We're going to email those gift cards, so we do need your email. If you already signed up on our website, you're good to go. We have your email, we'll match it with the exit survey. If not, you can enter your email into the chat and we'll match it that way. And finally, you can always sign up on our website belatedly and we'll still get that email from you and um, send out your Amazon gift card. For those of you who don't win the Amazon gift card, you can pick up swag bags from Meadowbrook today. Finally, our agenda for this morning or this afternoon now is the intro and Zoom etiquette, which I already went through. And then there are the Y STEAM topics by our workshop lead. Then our special guest speakers, and finally the Q&A panel with our special guest panelists. Last is the exit survey, which helps us improve the workshop, find out if you'd like to be matched with a STEAM mentor, and it also helps us keep the workshops free. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on now to our workshop lead, Myla Hightower. Hi there, can everybody hear me okay? Just put in my AirPods. Okay, sounds yep. good. Hi, my name is Myla Hightower. I am a senior at Xavier University studying biology pre-medicine. I am from Seattle, South Seattle specifically, born and raised. Um, I went to South Shore K through eight for most of my pre-high school years. And then I graduated from Cleveland in 2016. Um, I transferred to Cleveland for basketball my sophomore year of high school, but it is a STEM school or STEAM. So all of the students have to be in either a life sciences track or an engineering and design track. Fortunately, I was placed in the life sciences track and I fell in love with it. And it only took me about a semester or two after that to figure out that this is what I wanted to do for my career. And here I am. So why STEAM? There are hundreds, if not thousands of different STEAM careers and we'll explore some of those with you today. There are also many different pathways to a career in STEAM you can choose the one that fits you best. In the US, STEAM jobs are growing at twice the rate of non-STEAM jobs. There will definitely be jobs waiting for you when you finish with your schooling in STEAM. 
also in the US, the average pay for STEAM jobs is twice the rate for the average pay of non-STEAM jobs. Let's play a little game. Let's take a second to think about what you think of when you hear STEAM careers. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. So when you hear those things, what careers come to mind? Let's see what careers we can guess. You can use the chat box to enter your guesses. I'll give you guys a few moments to think of some careers. Let's see that chat box. Okay. So, one thing to note is that STEAM is very diverse. It is not just scientists and engineers, it's so much more. On the left, you'll see that top image shows a man and a woman in a science lab in sciencey coats, very sciencey. The bottom image shows a, a man and a woman in a music studio and they're using DJ mixing equipment. These are both STEAM careers. Now, like I said earlier, there are hundreds if not thousands of STEAM careers. And today we just wanted to highlight a range of careers to get your wheels turning on what's possible. Now, here are some science-based careers related to health and wellness. You have dentistry, nursing, pharmacy and medicine, lab technician, counseling and psychology, physical therapy and fitness. Other science pathways include the nature and life sciences, like what I'm in school for. Um, you have ecology and land stewardship, zoology, forestry, environmentalism, or becoming a veterinarian. On the technology side of things, you have game development, website or app developing, IT systems and security management, or on the business side, DevOps, business operations, digital marketing, and several more. Plus, on the media side of things, you can get into graphic designing, become a multimedia artist, digital animation, or multimedia creative directing. And on the technical art side of STEAM, you have entertainment and audiovisual careers like director of photography, videography, visual effects technician, or an audio engineer. Another cool thing about STEAM is that there are multiple pathways to get you into the career that you want. Virtually all careers in STEAM are going to require a high school diploma or a GED, so that's gonna be your first step. With one to two years of education or training after high school, you'll usually end up with a certificate or an associate's degree, four years will get you a bachelor's degree, and six to 12 years will get you a master's or doctoral degree. Now, 12 years might seem like a long time, but that time is gonna pass anyway. So where do you wanna be in 12 years? What do you wanna be doing? How do you wanna be spending your time? The key is to figure out what you're interested in, see what careers there are, and start down the path. And hey, don't worry about how to pay for your education. There are always scholarships, grants, and student loans that will help you cover the cost. And at the end of this workshop, we'll connect you with a resource guide that will help you with tutoring, scholarships, and much more. Another great thing about STEAM is that the jobs pay pretty well. We like to call it a family wage, meaning you can live on it and support a family. Each of the career fields we mentioned have a shorter path, a medium path, or a longer path. Usually the longer paths are gonna pay more, but not always. There are some two-year paths like information security or business operations that will pay as much as the six to 12-year path. We're talking 25 to 45 an hour, but it really depends on the specific career. So key takeaways to take from this workshop. First, there are many diverse careers in STEAM, all the way from engineers at Boeing or SpaceX to life sciences and multimedia artists. Second, there are multiple pathways to each career field. On average, careers in STEAM are gonna require one to 12 years of school, but again, that time is gonna pass anyway, so where do you wanna be? And third, if you put it all together, it's really about finding something you're interested in, choosing a pathway, and letting that take you to a career in STEAM. Lastly, it's important to remember that most jobs are gonna have ongoing training and education, so you can always switch pathways and careers if, if you change your mind. 
Now, I wanted to take a quick second to show you the resource guide that I mentioned. We are creating a guide for each workshop location with a list of local resources, including advising, tutoring, scholarships, computer labs, study spaces, free Wi-Fi, food, workshops, and so much more. You can find it via this link at the bottom of the page, startechga.org slash guide. If you ever forget it, you can just go to steamdiscoveryproject.org and the resource guide links will be right there in the menu. Here is a little example of what the resource guide looks like. You can click on the location of your choice and it'll take you to a customized list of support resources curated just for you. Now it is time for our first guest speaker. We have Bethany Ophelia, who is a computer engineer and leader in equity, diversity, and inclusion. Bethany, take it away. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Am I echoing or is it okay? Sounds great. Okay, good. I'm going to share my screen. I think I accidentally muted her. I've unmuted myself, so I'm back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the joy of technology. Okay, let me put this in presentation mode. So, hello, I wanna tell you about my career journey. I have been in STEAM my entire working life, which actually started when I was 14. And I've actually been in, I'm in my third career. So my first career, I was a model. And I did that for 21 years, and that overlapped with high school, college, and with the beginning of my computer engineering career. I then, in school, studied computer engineering and was an entrepreneur and um, for 12 years. After that, I became, got into this work that's kind of been new. The last 20 years, is it's got its own category, diversity and inclusion work that all companies do. So when I started out, my arts were, were modeling, and that actually taught me skills that I have used in on my both my other careers. And then I went to University of Washington to study computer science. I was a NASA scholar, and that was a very difficult time for me um, because I was an integrator, it turns out. I was the first black woman there and allowed in the department in 10 years. And I learned some skills there that I continued applying that I would highly recommend. One is working, having affirmations for yourself, having a good support system. And I also learned it is really important to be organized. Okay, so those are things I learned. So I did school and the whole time I became an entrepreneur. I only worked in an office for a year and a half before I realized I just, it wasn't necessary for me to be in an office and I did not like losing the time of 45 minutes to an hour and a half in each direction to get to a place so that I could write code that existed on another machine in another building. And so I quit and I started my own consulting firm and um, I really found my sweet spot as an engineer. So then in parallel, I was a model and an engineer running my company and in running my company, my sweet spot was being a smoke jumper is what I call it, a fixer. A fixer. And in that, I got to, to flex a lot of skills in, in computing. What I dealt with is data driven websites and devices and applications and apps. And that actually involved several different types of engineering. And I really enjoyed it. Did that for 12 years. And then I applied for a contract that I thought was something for my company. And it turns out it was a full time position in a remote company. And um, as I was beginning to have my family, I thought, you know, this would be a good, a good thing for me. I'd like the stability. Um, when you run your own business, it has its advantages for sure. You're your own boss, but you're also um, the janitor and the accountant and the marketing department, especially when you start small. And so I thought it would be good to have some structure. I have a limit to what I had to do. And so I started working with Open Text as a senior engineer in healthcare software. And healthcare is one of the types of software I've really enjoyed working with in my computer career. And, and a great thing to note is it's a growing industry. One thing to note about if you have any interest in computers is there is a shortage of engineers, a shortage in the whole world, a shortage. So if you get it, you're hired, you got this, you will always find a job. I have never gone more than two weeks 
without having worked in the last 23 years. And so that's something for you to note. When you pick a, a job, look at, is, do people need what you want to do? Find something you like, find something you enjoy, find something that makes you good money. And STEAM is a great way to go, but also find something where they need folks in it. And there's, there's multiple industries like that. So then I began unknowingly my transition to my third career, which is where I am now. I'm the director of equity, diversity, and inclusion at OpenText for all their global programs. It's a company with 15,000 people in 34 countries. And um, the way I transitioned that, so this is skills I used actually from, from modeling. Modeling taught me um, a lot about marketing and advertising, but the, the side is the social skills that it gave me. That is a highly social job. You have to be able to meet with, interact, and make people comfortable with you extremely quickly, understand what they want, and make it happen. And so um, our company had some volunteer opportunities that I made for myself by reaching out to the CEO after George Floyd was murdered and he expressed um, support for Black Lives Matter. And our whole company had gone to remote where before only a small percentage were remote and, and people were having a hard time with how do we transition? And they asked for advice. So I reached out, gave some advice and I pointed out like, you don't need to stress about turning the camera on. People can have relationships without seeing each other all of the time. And in fact, turning off the camera turns off visual biases for a while. So that's just something to consider. You free yourself from your constraints that you've been visually socialized for your entire life when you don't look at the people that you interact with. And um, that began my relationship with the CEO of OpenText. And I was invited to help plan a listening tour around Black Lives Matter, which I took that opportunity. I planned it. I facilitated two of the um, sessions and I took that opportunity to give my ideas for how OpenText could do better with diversity and inclusion. And if you want to think about what is inclusion, it's the opposite of bullying, basically. It's making people feel like they belong, being inclusive. And, um, and, and then they invited me to help join a working group to plan how do we create a better strategy for open text based on all the suggestions that were, were received during the listening tour. And so I joined it. And so I did this while doing my, my other job. But that was OK, because I've been used to having two jobs in my life. So I could do that. And I enjoyed it. And I knew it was an opportunity for me for something. I didn't know exactly what, but I, was, I went from one minute being in a very small group um, with no contact with anybody above a manager level to working directly with the chief of the company, with vice presidents, senior vice presidents, chief, chief executive officer. And I knew that it was a chance to kind of show what I could do to make my break into leadership. And, um, and when everything was said and done and we created the strategy across six months, um, they called me and invited me to lead it. And so now I've started my third career and I have been leading these diversity and inclusion efforts for, for open text. And where we are now is I'm the leader and we are implementing the global strategy. Let me show you that. This is what we came, uh, we, we came together with. This is our pillars uh, for diversity and inclusion at open text. And that's awareness, which is your education and your culture and your conversations, hiring and developing, because you cannot have greater diversity unless you focus on how you hire people, how you promote them, how you retain them. Civic action, which many of you might not know this, but almost all corporations do charity work and they donate both. They do volunteer work and donate. And so this is about putting a lens, a proper lens on helping underrepresented people in those actions. The other side is the power of our business because we spend money. Companies spend money. Where you spend your money matters. You can spend it with minority companies. You can spend it with companies that have your same values. And that's possible to do that. The other side is we make software. Open Text is a data management and integration company. Enterprise level, banks run on our software. We are the big data behind big data. Google is our customer. So I want you to think about it like that. So we have power in how we write our software to be more inclusive. And that's part of the power of our business. And that's why we made a whole pillar around that. And we have analysis and governance because if you don't measure it, you won't treasure it. And when you treasure it, you measure it. So that's what analysis and governance is. It's also about our processes policy, and policies. 
It's how you do things. And you need to look at your system. So that's what we came up with. And then I created this structure to illustrate the way in which this new department, so the outcome of having a powerful listening tour was that an entirely new department was created at Open Text, and that's the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Department, which I am the leader of. And I help to help people conceptualize the newness of what we're doing, I drew this picture for folks. And then I share it with the leaders, and I share it with the employees, and we, I collaborate all the time with these various layers of expertise. I work with the lawyers. I work with people who deal with organizational effectiveness. I work with your talent acquisition. I work with the, the information technology department. And I work with these impact teams. That's one of the ways we decided to organize is we have these volunteer teams that then help implement our initiative so that it can percolate throughout the entire business. And in seven months since I've taken that job, we've got 900 participants, um, and I'm managing eight different teams. And so what I want to tell you with this is that there's tons of types of careers in STEAM. I'm literally at a company with 15,000 people, and when we're going to try and make our job descriptions more inclusive, we realize our baseline amount of jobs is like 200 different jobs. All of those are STEAM jobs in every kind of department, from finance, to your software engineers, to your network engineers, to your creative department. We have a creative department. We have graphic designers. We have people who are specialized in communication and they write. We have writers that work for us. And whatever you decide to do, remember that the only way you fail is if you give up. So don't give up. Don't give up ever. And I highly recommend you have affirmations. For me, to this day, this is what I used. I took this off of my bathroom mirror and took a picture of it. My, my grandfather got it laminated for me and all of his 30 grandchildren and all of his 10 children 20 years ago for yourself as you go out and try and do good things for yourself and your family and the world. So I'm going to read this poem. It's called Our Greatest Fear by Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God, and your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. You were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. That was amazing. All righty. Next up, we have Caitlin Sylvester, who is an offshore marine scientist. All right. I'm going to start sharing. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Everyone hear me and see my slides? Oops, that's good. Is that working? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I am Katie Sylvester. Um, I am a marine scientist. Uh, I was born and raised in Seattle. I currently live over on the east side with my two daughters that are two and four and my husband and our dog. So I'm going to talk through a little bit about what I currently do as a marine scientist and then go through my journey and how I got to where I'm at today. So um, in my current position, I work for a company called AECOM. They are a environmental consulting company. And what that means is that clients hire us. Um, it can be a private company or a um, government organization. They hire us to solve a problem for them. And that can be an engineering problem, a science problem, um, you name it we tackle it all, um, all aspects of engineering and science 
for me, I deal mostly um, in marine science and I'm also a project manager. And my specialty is in offshore habitat assessments. So my two biggest clients and projects that I have are in offshore uh, wind energy. And that's um, kind of the front side of constructing an offshore wind farm, looking at what's gonna be the habitat impact and um, what, what the construction companies and the wind farms need to know before they lay down any sort of structure in the environment. And the other side of things that I work on is for the government, um, looking at offshore habitats once they've been impacted by dredge material, which that means sediment or dirt or mud that has been taken from a harbor or a river and then placed offshore, um, how that's impacted what's going on offshore. So just a few examples of the data that I look at on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this black and white image over here is a swath of the seafloor that was mapped by a boat um, out on the ocean. So the boat goes out and collects a bunch of data and then it comes back onto my desk and I map it up to make it um, viewable for our clients. Um, so this tells us a few things here. You can see there's some sand waves on the seafloor. Um, it's a boulder field here and then some smooth sand here. Um, and then another way that we look at things is just through camera imagery. We um, can send a camera down onto the seafloor and take a look at the side of um, the seafloor. So it kind of slices down through the seafloor and takes a picture and then also pair it with the top. So in this particular image, you can see that there are some sand dollars down there um, on a sandy environment. And then another side of things that I look at, and this sort of ties into what Myla and Adrian were talking about with the art side of STEAM is I have to figure out how to make it look nice for people to view. So our clients have us collect data and then they want it to be presented in a certain way. Um, can be either for a really technical presentation or just for the public and get them to have their eyes catching it. So in this image up here, um, I'm presenting another image of the seafloor from data that has been collected, um, but showing the red is a little bit of a harder environment. And then this central portion is showing a softer environment with some, some hard um, substrate on top as well. So that's a little bit of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis at a high level. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I got here and how this career sort of interested me. So like I said, I was born and raised in Seattle. Um, I came up through Washington Middle School and then went to Garfield High School, um, graduated in 2002. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love Seattle, I love it here, um, it's my home and I really, middle school high school it was tough um i was on that track because i had a sibling who was in the advanced placement program um i wasn't so i was kind of falling behind and kind of falling in the middle and nothing was really sparking my interest because i wasn't learning the same as everybody else um it wasn't until i took a marine science class at garfield that i realized i needed to learn through applying what i had learned so I had a great teacher, his name is Spang um, at Garfield, and he taught us everything that you maybe didn't even want to know about marine organisms. So we learned about their ecosystems, their nervous systems, where they might live. And it was the first time that I had found something in a classroom that I could take out into the real world. So I could go to Lincoln Park or Alki or Discovery Park and at low tide see everything that I had just learned about. And it almost to me felt like I was seeing um, like celebrities. Like I had only seen these things in the aquarium. And then I went out to at low tide and I was like, I understand these things. And I could also teach my parents something. They didn't know about it. And I was able to kind of regurgitate the information that I had learned and expand on it. Um, so after this course um, was done, I talked to my marine science teacher who served as a mentor for me through high school. Um, he saw that this was something that I had really latched onto and kind of tried to think about the next step for me. So he encouraged me to apply to a program. Um, the University of Southern California was deciding to take high school students um, from all over the country and have a two week program where they were just entrenched in marine science. 
I didn't want to apply to it. Um, I didn't have good grades. I didn't think I was going to get in and I didn't want to just apply to be rejected. So he encouraged me. He said, just do it and try. And I ended up being accepted and I'm glad that he encouraged me to do it. Um, so it ended up being a week on shore where we were snorkeling and counting fish and just learning about the environment. And then also a week offshore, where we were learning what happens when you're on a research vessel and what sort of information are you collecting and how you would apply that. Um, after this program was through, I had kind of started to be convinced that maybe college would be the right path for me. I wasn't convinced before that. I wanted to be done with school because I wasn't enjoying it. Um, so I started looking around at different universities and what I was finding that for marine science, I was, all the universities wanted you to get a four year degree in biology and then expand on it with a master's degree. So another two years to get a marine science degree. I didn't want to do that. I barely wanted to go to college. So I wanted to be done in four years. And I found a program at the University of New Hampshire that allowed for a degree in biology with an emphasis in marine science. Um, being from Seattle, I, I wasn't even really sure where New Hampshire was in New England, but I thought I'm gonna go for it because this looks like the right opportunity for me. Um, that was a mistake <laughs> because I didn't love it. Um, it was a completely different environment from what I was used to. I just didn't feel like I fit in. I wasn't from the same place that a lot of people were from and it was tough already having struggled through high school. It was tough to also have that struggle in college. So I reached back to my marine science teacher a lot um, from high school who kind of encouraged me to keep going um, and reminded me what I was doing there in the first place. And I looked around for just something else where I could find a program that again would allow me to apply what I was learning. Um, and I found a program at that was run through Duke University where they were taking a group of college students to go to their marine lab for half of your semester and then go to a marine lab in Bermuda for half of your semester. And it was again a situation where I didn't want to apply because I wasn't doing great in college and I thought I was going to be rejected, but I ended up doing it and being accepted and it was another great opportunity to um, expand on what I was interested in and also further my skill set. Um, that's a picture of me also collecting some information and scuba diving, which I realized that I, I also really love. So after college, um, graduated and took a position out at the Pacific Northwest, Northwest National Laboratory and SWIM. Um, it was a great opportunity. Um, however, it also was met with a lot of challenges. Um, I wasn't, Bethany mentioned inclusion in her talk and there just wasn't a lot of that for me as a young, female scientist, um, I felt pretty discouraged. I worked with a lot of people that were smart and coming in with a bachelor's degree at this lab, it was not always celebrated. Um, and I let it get to me as somebody that had struggled up through school, um, being here, I just, it got to me. And after a year, I decided to give up. And fortunately, <laughs> something that I had also learned in college was how to wait tables and bartend. So I leaned back on that and for two and a half years, I um, waited tables and kind of tried to recenter myself. And two years into that, I thought I need to get back to what was exciting to me and what, and figure out what I liked about what I was doing before. So I started a unpaid internship at a small nonprofit organization. It was kind of like a punch in the gut because I was not really doing marine science. I was it was just kind of something to put on my resume so it looked like I was doing something in the two years that I hadn't been working. Um, and I just started applying to jobs. I applied to probably 20 to 25 plus jobs and finally got an interview at AECOM. So I've been at AECOM for um, 12 plus years. Um, I started as a very entry level scientist um, and I've worked my way up to be a senior marine scientist and a project manager and um, I found myself in a lot of positions where I'm the only woman, I'm the only woman on the scuba diving team, um, but I just kind of stuck with it and uh, I'm happy that I did. So I just wanted to give some lessons learned on what I've learned um, throughout my STEAM career is 
that we all learn differently. Um, everybody learns differently. It's hard for some people just to have information fed to them and then to spit it back out. You know, a lot of us need to apply what we're doing. And I think that STEAM really helps um, people that need the application process when they're learning. Um, and it's okay to be okay. I was never an A plus student. C's were good for me and you can still do great things and that's fine. Um, if you don't give up and Bethany also touched on this, you're gonna get to where you wanna be. If you just keep focused and keep your eye on where you wanna go, you're gonna get there. And then this is kind of a reminder to myself too, as I was putting this presentation together is that celebrate your own victories and just remind yourself of what you've accomplished as you go along the way. And that's it. Thank you, Caitlin. Great job. Okay, I'll take it back over here. Okay. Thank you so much to our guest speakers. Okay. Just waiting for the page to catch up with me. Now it is time for uh -oh. one, two, many. There we go. <clears throat> now we will transition to our Q&A question and answer period. Um, if you have any questions, you can physically raise your hand. We are watching on the cameras so we can see you and call you on you. Um, or if you have access to the chat, you can type questions in the chat or just type a question in the chat. Um, so for our panelists, we have our guest speakers who you're already familiar with. Bethany O'Feely, who is a computer engineer and leader in equity, diversity and inclusion. Caitlin Sylvester, our offshore marine scientist. We have JL Babb, who is a biopharmaceutical equipment qualification specialist. Hello. And Bobby Brzezinski, who works in biopharmaceutical manufacturing. So if anyone, I'm trying to see where the kids are at. Um, if anyone has any questions that they could think of off the top of their head, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I'll give you guys a minute to think of some questions. And in the meantime, I can get us started. Let's see. Um, JL, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what you wish you would have known when you graduated high school that you know now that you didn't know then? Uh, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, what I do is I basically test equipment for um, biopharmaceuticals. So whenever there's a medication that needs to be created, um, the equipment that they use and the facilities that they use to make the medicine, it's tested by people like me. And um, since it's medicine that's supposed to be saving people's lives, uh, the Food and Drug Administration has a pretty tight hold on, um, I guess, the purity and effectiveness of those medications. So there's a lot of testing that goes into those processes, and you have to make certain that whatever you're producing, you know exactly what it is and exactly what it does. And so that high level of control is basically proved by qualification, which is the majority of my job. Um, as far as things that I know now that I wish I knew in high school, there's, there's a pretty long list. I'm about 10 years out of high school, which isn't a lot, but you do change so much in that amount of time. Uh, so one thing that I would say persisted or something that's constant throughout pretty much from birth to I assume death is the value of making connections. Uh, so in STEM, the careers that you mostly think about um, like engineering or being a scientist or something, you don't traditionally associate that with being really good at talking to people but that is something that is totally necessary. Wherever you want to go in life, whatever you want to do, it's so much easier knowing somebody who can kind of get you into that or even knowing somebody who's experienced it and can at least explain to you 
uh, what to expect, kind of like what we're doing here today. So I would say that that's the most important thing. And to touch on something that Caitlin and Bethany both mentioned, uh, there's, you shouldn't get too discouraged if things aren't going well. You just, you kind of have to stick with it. Even when you don't know where you're gonna end up, you should just really stick with it. Because as Bethany said, the time is going to pass anyway. And so you have to look at where you wanna be and look at where you're at. And as long as you're continually moving forward or at least not moving backward, you're doing something great. Thank you. That is a great answer to our question. Um, it looks like Abigail has a question. You can um, go ahead and unmute yourself, I believe, Adri. I think I requested for her to unmute. Um, yeah, so my question was for Caitlin. She talked a lot about, a lot about like fear in her thing. I'm just wondering, how did you overcome that with like, oh, I'm gonna just get over it. It's just better to do it now or never, or was it like a slow process? Um, fear as far as like being worried that I'm gonna be rejected. Is that, I think that's what you're- Yeah. Thinking. Yeah. Um, I don't know that you ever get over it. <laughs> I think you just kind of, you have to just keep moving forward and know that sometimes you might get rejected. Um, but you know what? It actually, I found that I actually surprised myself and it doesn't happen as often as I think you doubt yourself or you believe that it's going to happen. So I would just, I just keep trying and I, I don't know, <laughs> it's going to happen no matter what. So I think that you just got to go for it. And if you get rejected, kind of prepare yourself for that. Um, and then, like I said, when you don't get rejected and you have an accomplishment, just make sure you celebrate it. And then I think it gets easier. Great question, Abigail. Um, I too would like to add for myself, my, um, I have my graduate school pretty much if I wanna go get a PhD for free, like I have it totally paid for through this research opportunity that I got from school that I applied to completely expecting that I wouldn't get in either. Um, and my school kind of connected me with it and I thought, you know, my grades weren't good enough and they totally accepted me. And then there's an amazing, you know, package that comes just from being accepted. So. Don't be discouraged. And even if you think you're not going to get it, I always say at least try because the worst thing you're going to hear is no. Um. Yeah, I'd love to add um, if you find your fear is freezing you, so you're hearing people say, go ahead and do it anyway, right? Like, so courage is not not being afraid, courage is doing it even though you feel afraid. That's courage. Um, but if the fear is freezing you, then get your support system, find somebody to help walk with you. Okay. And, and then that's, that's the way to help you get past it. Like, and for me personally, one of the ways I get past fear is I make a plan and then I just try to follow the steps and then each step can help me. Cause I can get like, so afraid I might want to freeze and not do anything. And so that, that's a way to, to, um, shake yourself out of that. Um, Bethany, I was wondering, do you still have to keep getting training for what you do, especially considering your new job title? That's a great question. Um, yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, at my, my company at OpenText, they have what they call an educational reimbursement program. And it's renews every year and it's $3,000 towards your education. And I have a chunk of colleagues who in their time at open text have gotten master's degrees little by little part time and it's been reimbursed. And as soon as I got this job. Yeah, I like bought a bunch of books and signed up for a bunch of conferences. And then I'm actually planning on taking something that's going to give me a certification that I already got approved by my boss that will take half of my um, my, my reimbursement. It's called a design thinking program. So I would say, I mean, you don't have to once you're in your job, but I would recommend it. And the reality is to stay fresh, you should. 
it keeps you competitive. Um, but I'm like not constantly doing it also, right? So there's a, you know, getting balance on how overwhelmed you might might feel too. But definitely continuing education is, is pretty much a part of most jobs. And the people who just embrace it and do it end up doing better long-term. Oh, I think you're muted, Myla. Sorry, thank you. Um, my job does something similar with um, paying for, you know, continue education. And um, I feel like those jobs tend to uh, trend towards being better to their employees in general, you know, when they, um, you know, encourage you to pursue your education or continue your education. So, um, Bobby. I was wondering how you got into your. Uh, what was that? Uh, how I got into biotech? Is that the question? I think she froze, right? Yeah, she's frozen. That was the question, I believe. Okay. Well, I actually, um, going back on what others have spoke about on. Uh, not giving up and like hard times and stuff like that. Um, it took me seven years to get my bachelor's degree. Uh, I uh, got in, I started off doing a, a biology degree at Arizona State University. And when I took microbiology, I got, I actually failed that class. And I think one other class that I knew too well um, I even got put on academic probation and I switched majors to education for like, I almost finished my education major, but they made me take an upper division science class. So in that science class, I learned about proteins to help fight cancer or other type of diseases. And that got me back into the biology degree which I finished and uh, once I was done, I didn't have any experience. So then I took a, um, I moved up here to Washington from Arizona uh, back in 2011. And when I was looking for jobs, everyone kept on telling me you don't have any experience. So I went to Shoreline, which they have a, uh, a certificate program. And after com um, completing that program, uh, let me back up a little bit. During the uh, during that program, they they part of the program is you have to get a job to get the certificate. So they help you out with building your resume and get you connections on different labs in the area. Because in Seattle area, there's over a hundred plus registered labs uh, in the area. So what drove me to go into this whole biology thing is ever since I was a kid, I always just wanted to help people, right? So uh, during the, I didn't know what I wanted to do until like I actually got a job through this program and then I found manufacturing drugs where you make the drugs for anywhere between a thousand or maybe even just a couple hundred people to 500,000 to a million people worldwide. So uh, I actually got it by someone just giving me a chance because I have the, um, I had the experience to, that certificate shoreline actually got me in. So it's really about re like everyone else said, like not giving up and just like, you know what you wanna do and sure there's gonna be ob obstacles as you uh, continue your pathway to where you wanna be. Um, so that's how I got in there. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. I think we have to wrap it up for the exit service. Do we have time for maybe one more question, Myla? Yes. Um, yeah, I think what, 350? Um, well, I would love if everyone could briefly actually just go through and tell us uh, about how many times or how much hours you spend a week working or in the office, out of the office, but um, briefly, if everyone could share that really quickly, so we just have an idea of what the time commitment is like for your job. 
We'll just start with Bobby. Uh, okay. Um, typically, it's 40 hours a week. Um, and then whenever, I would say like half the year, it's anywhere between like 30 to 40 hours of overtime uh, per check. So like every two, every week you're putting in about, about 10 to 20 hours of overtime. On, uh, but that I'm telling you, overtime, if you're not salary, is is bank. Yeah, it definitely like makes it, it makes it towards where you want to sign up for overtime all the time. Like, please sign me up and give me this overtime check. And then uh, you have long breaks where you're not so busy. And if you put in like a four hour day, it's like, all right, go ahead and sign up for eight hours. So it has its ups and downs. Gotcha. All right, sorry, took a while to unmute. Um, for me, uh, it's about the same as uh, Bobby, 40 hours a week uh, for the majority of the year. Uh, but since I'm a consultant, and just get shipped around to different sites. It's usually only when they really need like an extra pair of hands. So a lot of the time you do end up working like 60 to 80 hour weeks, but like Bobby said, it does come with overtime. So they make it worth your while. Gotcha. Bethany? Um, yeah, mine is, I'm at 40 hours a week. Um, there'll be times when things come up where I need to do some extra. Um, and then I make sure to the next week do less. I also, there's something I learned um, in like this type of job I'm in. It's not just the hours I'm in front of my machine, right? I spend a lot of time thinking about this strategizing. So then I might say, I'm going to sit in front of my machine for six hours because 40 hours a week is eight hours a day, kind of like what the high schoolers are used to for school. Um, but I'm going to be in front of my machine for six hours and then I'm going to go just spend time with my kids and talk with my husband and do my exercise because during that time I'm still doing things. And so then I'm not necessarily for my 40 sitting in front of my machine that whole 40. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I definitely recommend like, you know, if, if a person does overtime, do it because you're being paid, paid extra money to do the overtime. Mm -hmm. And if you're not being paid extra money to do the overtime, then don't do it. And the answer is, I cannot get that done in the 40 hours that I have this week. And uh, we need more resources because people get burnt out. And when you're a highly productive worker, people will just work you forever until you crash. And I learned early in my career that just because I can put in more hours and do more work, if it's not something I'm actually being paid for or scared scheduled for then to not do that and instead be very, very efficient and be honest when it's time for more resources. Well said. That is a good um, skill to develop for sure, especially working in these long week um, careers saying no. <laughs> um, I think that yeah. is about all the time we have for our Q&A. Thank you to all of our panelists for answering all those questions, those are great answers. Can I uh, put one more thing in? Say one more thing? Yeah. Just so that the kids know, JL and I work to get, we work together and he's actually qualified our my manufacturing plant. Oh. Uh, so we're kind of together. That is cool. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Uh, a quick note before we do our exit survey. Um, if any of you guys are interested in mentors, let us know in the exit survey and we'll match you up with someone. Um, and they'll have, we'll have your mentor reach out to you via email soon. And now here is the exit survey. We're going to go ahead and put the link in the chat box. Um, the survey takes five minutes or less and remember to enter your email into the survey to win the $25 Amazon gift card. Um, once you're done with the survey, you can go ahead and exit the meeting. And thank you guys so much for coming and listening.
Um, and thank you for your great questions. Don't forget to check out steamdiscoveryproject.org for extra resources. And thank you again to all of our guest speakers.